Then probably Good evening, everyone. My name is Naomi Feinberg, and I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's big debate entitled Addiction, Compulsive Behavior, and Unhealthy Habits, Common Etiology, and Implications for Practice. Now, the World Health Organization, through its 11th revision of the International Classification of Diseases, has shone a spotlight on this hitherto rather underserved area of psychiatry. And as many of you will know, we now have two new disorders of behavioral addiction, gambling disorder and gaming disorder, somewhat compulsive uh, addiction. And we also have a whole new family of obsessive compulsive and related disorders, including obsessive compulsive disorder, body dysmorphic disorder, but also hoarding disorder, hypochondriasis, and two body focused habit disorders, hair pulling and skin picking disorder. And then of course, we also have compulsive sexual behavior disorder, which is classified in the impulse control disorders, classified according and introduced according to clinical utility and public health need. But, and, and, and it's against this backdrop that this debate is set. But has the, we, we should ask ourselves, has the World Health Organization got it right? Has it gone too far with including all these new diagnoses and disorders? Or has it not gone far enough? Are there other important disorders of behavior addiction, for example, that deserve a diagnosis? And have we carved nature truly at its joints? And according to emerging scientific evidence that suggests greater similarity across these disorders, should a more holistic approach to assessment, diagnosis, and ultimately treatment be, uh, be uh, approached? So uh, this is going to be the focus of tonight's debate, and we're privileged to have a stellar panel of international experts <coughs> to discuss these themes with us. They've promised to generate a lively, thought-provoking, and enjoyable debate. We'll have some interactive work. And so without more ado, I'm going to ask our panel to introduce ourselves. And I think we'll start with you, Jolt. Oh, thank you. Um, <coughs> my name is Jolt Dermatovic. Also honored to be here. And uh, I'm a clinical psychologist and cultural anthropologist and uh, have two affiliations. Um, one is as uh, <coughs> chair of the Center of Excellence in Responsible Gaming, the University of Gibraltar, and uh, as head of, uh, head of uh, addiction research at the Utrecht Lorand University in uh, Budapest, Hungary. And originally I did research more on uh, substance-related addictions, but in the past 15 uh, years, it, it moved rather towards behavior addictions, including video game use and gambling, but also like exercise addiction and uh, compulsive buying and shopping as well. So, so many <coughs> different things. So that's, and I'm also uh, president of the International Society of the, for the Study of Behavioral Addictions. 
Um, yeah, so that's about me and thanks again for the possibility to be here. Thank you, Zelt. Wim. Yeah, my name is Wim Vandenbrink and I'm an emeritus professor of uh, psychiatry and addiction at the uh, Academic Medical Center at the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And uh, I'm also still the, uh, the president of the uh, International Collaboration of Subs uh, ADHD and Substance Abuse. And, and there I really found out very quickly that uh, maybe ADHD should also be in this whole range of uh, disorders because uh, if you see the overlap between ADHD and many of these disorders, that is also quite uh, amazing. I actually come from uh, really the field of hardcore uh, substance use disorders, uh, opiates, uh, uh, alcohol, and, and some cocaine. But uh, I got interested mainly through, uh, uh, I think, result in, uh, in other disorders such as the behavioral addictions. Thank you, Vim. Sophia. Hi, I'm Sophia Schaff, and I'm an addiction psychiatrist by training. Started like this, interested in uh, gaming. Uh, dysfunctional use at the very beginning, specialized in addiction medicine, then in addictive behaviors, and I'm running the outpatient specialized facility in Switzerland, pioneering since 2007 in the treatment of addictive behaviors, including uh, gaming and other uh, uh, disorders. And I uh, am teaching at the University of Geneva, Faculty of Medicine, uh, did some research, clinical research uh, uh, on addictive behaviors. And I'm uh, the member of the expert group, federal, Swiss federal expert group on cyber addiction uh, at the federal level and engaged with WHO in some collaborating project as well. Thank you for having thank me here. Thank you, Sophia. Fernando. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. I am Fernando Fernandez Aranda, based in Barcelona, in Spain, clinical psychologist, um, head of the eating disorders unit at the Belviche Hospital and full professor at the University of Barcelona. Uh, many years also abroad in Germany, basically, but also in other countries, and always interested in uh, doing research, uh, translational research, basically, but also to see uh, the commonalities that might be there between eating disorders and behavioral addictions, also differences how we may apply a transdiagnostic approach if we see that there are some overlaps between one and the others, and also how we may personalize somehow the approach if we think what type of vulnerabilities might be in common among the different disorders. It's a great pleasure to be here, thank you. Thank you, Fernando. So, before we start, please could the audience switch on their mobile phones, take a picture of the QR code, because we need the QR code to vote, and then I'll give you a moment or two, and then Silke in the back in the projection room is going to project up our first discussion point just to get the juices flowing. We're going to all vote on this first statement. So I'll give you another couple of seconds to get your voting because you're going to vote through your mobile phone, okay? So please get ready. Okay, Silka, can you put up the first discussion point? So current diagnostic systems and clinical services do not go far enough in clustering yes. disorders of addiction, compulsion, and habit together. And the answers you can give are agree, don't know, or disagree. And here we go, scoring. I'll give you another couple of seconds, but we have agree, 60%-ish, don't know, about 30%, and disagree, about 50%. 15%. So our job in this debate is to help you think through these issues and perhaps even change your minds. So we have a second, just to check we're doing this correctly. Silke, can you put up the second question, please? So this pushes us a bit further. Joined up clinical services should be provided 
covering all disorders of addiction, compulsion, impulse control, and habits. So give us your views on that. Oh, goodness, even more. So we've got 70% approximately say yes, and a determined 13% say no. So let's see how the debate goes. I have a number of tabled questions that I'm going to ask the panel. They're going to speak for a few minutes. We'll see how many we get through. We've got six or seven. And then at the end of the debate, we're going to put up those first two questions again and see whether we have or haven't changed our minds. So the first question I've received, it's, it's a statement and it says, Gambling disorder and gaming disorder should be recognized as full mental disorders deserving clinical attention. So I think the first person to ask for this would be Jolt. Can, can you give us your view on that statement? Well, um, I, I, I think that, uh, yeah, so I'm, as you said, so the decision has been made. So, I mean, they, uh, we consider them as, as a as distinct disorders at, at the moment. And I, I think that it was, obviously there are questions and there will be questions, but I think that it, it was a good decision. It was clear that, uh, also it was quite clear in, back in 2013, when the, during the DSM renewal, it was said that there's not enough evidence. So we should look a little bit more to the data. We should have a little bit more uh, evidence to see whether the uh, inclusion of gaming disorder or whatever, there were other ideas to uh, how to call it, but gaming disorder should be included in the diagnostic system. And that time the decision was no. So let's, let's wait a little bit. Let's see uh, if we have uh, more data. And then in 2019, the, the, uh, when the ICD a revision was made, then it was included. And I think that what we see, that there was a debate, so we know it was quite well uh, seen in the literature, uh, but what, we, what the conclusion was there, also from, that was my uh, understanding at least, that also from the clinical, from a clinical perspective, and also from the research perspective, it was clear that Obviously, that's an everyday activity, video game use on one hand, but there's a small proportion of users who really face uh, very serious uh, problems, and that was a, a reason enough to, for, for the inclusion. It seemed that those arguing against, they were rather coming from the media research or communication research area, which is understandable because from that perspective, that's rather, or, or video game use is rather a cultural uh, phenomenon, but from a clinical perspective, it seems that beside that, we also see a population who, who has serious problems. So I think that that's very an eye, yeah, and, and, and that what was made a good decision, yeah. So the, the decision has been made, that's where we are, and we think that that's right. But if, if these are disorders, how then, how and where, you know, these are, very ubiquitous behaviors. We're all on games and, and some of us are gambling. So how do we implement the boundaries with normal behavior? Sophia. Thank you for the, the question. My opinion, I will rely uh, upon my experience, 16 years of experience in clinical settings, dealing with demands coming from people suffering from these uh, dysfunctional uh, behaviors, be them gaming or gambling their relatives uh, really struggling with certain limits. And limits is the key point for me, how to set limits bef be between normal behaviors and dysfunctional addictive behaviors in terms of gaming and gambling. And the uh, choice that has been made by the WHO uh, developing group for ICD-11 is a good one. It's relying upon telling that if there is distress, if there is functional impairment, there, there is an issue and there we can go further in assessing 
and the assessment in setting boundaries between normality and uh, pathology in terms of behaviors, it uh, should rely upon as well the psychological function underlying this misuse of these uh, platforms, gaming and gambling. I, is that so this wouldn't that yes. be a problem? Like, if you think how we see, look at uh, mental disorders now, and most of the big epidemiological data show that uh, uh, half of the population ever had a mental disorder, a quarter of the, the, the general population has a current mental disorder. Uh, the rest of the world uh, and the rest of medical specialists, they say, come on, this, this cannot all be pathology. And so I think there is, there is an issue there. And uh, not so much for the people who come to, to addiction treatment centers, because before anybody goes to addiction treatment center, things have really run out of hand. But if you think about our epidemiological work, uh, just thinking about gaming disorder, if you see it, uh, uh, you have the diagnosis now, and within a year, uh, two-thirds uh, are losing the diagnosis spontaneously, and within two years, 90% doesn't have a diagnosis anymore in epidemiological studies. I think so. We have to be careful there and really put, uh, yeah, think about where the, the thresholds are in basically our scientific epidemiological work. As far as it goes with people who come to, to treatment, most of the time they're just too late to come and they have serious problems. But uh, so I think we have to be kind of careful about these issues. The same is true for uh, calling everything an addiction. And so we get to, and we, maybe we come to that, the buying addiction and uh, the work all this. Um, uh, so everything is become an addiction. And so it's a kind of box of Pandora that we open and how, we keep we, how do we keep it reasonable? So I think there is an issue. Uh, so I don't, I disagree with with Zolt or you, but I think there is a reason to be careful. Yeah. So, so I, I fully agree. So we have to be very cautious with next inclusions, and there are many questions remain. So that's maybe one of the most important: the that how permanent or or how temporal such a case, what we call ga gaming disorder at the moment, and then the question of stigmatization is again related so there, there, there are many questions uh, remained and also about the other disorders or other phenomenon phenomena now we have to be very careful that that's for sure so it yeah. uh, and following that discussion probably we have also to take into account many other factors that we have con to consider comorbidity among them so they have not pure disorders they may have if we think in eating disorders around 25 percent they may have alcohol and drug abuse. So if we think also temporal uh, vari variables, if we think maybe 20 years ago, we have not gaming disorders, but we have now. We were not discussing about probably being cheating disorders who were undetected, but now we are discussing because we are exploring and characterizing better these specific phenotypes. And uh, also we may need, you have mentioned that too, we may need to take into account crossover diagnosis. So in eating disorders, a patient may start with anorexia with 15 years old and may end with 40 with binge eating disorder because recover partially from anorexia, develop a bulimia, increase the weight, later has no uh, uh, vomits and then only binge episodes and then has a binge eating disorder. So this is making difficult also the research, also from a epidemiological perspective, but also from clinical perspective. Yeah. So certainly good quality longitudinal studies would be a real advantage in this area that don't really exist at the moment. But we generally, I think broadly the panel are accepting this, but exercising caution and precision what about the classic moving on to classification i mean do behavioral addictions should they be classified together with substance addictions and on what basis etiology neurobiology motivational mechanisms um vin you're firmly in the addiction field <laughs> what, what do you think yeah i think there altogether i think uh, i mean i'm in favor of uh, of lumping more than in splitting and so 
you have to be careful with lumping that we don't call everything, uh, just give it the one word because the behaviors look more or less similar. But I think there's quite some research now on definitely pathological gambling or gambling disorder and the substance use disorder that in terms of etiology, we have to be f careful there, but in terms of etiology, definitely in terms of the uh, shared vulnerability, genetic vulnerability, but also in terms of the underlying neurobiology. I think there is very good indications definitely for substance use disorders and for pathological gambling. I think it's quite, quite clear that, that there is a big overlap. It's not identical, but it's difficult to say because the, uh, if you think about the substance uses, there is of course also the effects on the brain of the, the drug use itself, which is much less the case of course in, uh, in, in, in gambling or gaming disorders. For gaming disorder, I think there are some first indications that they have a similar course. Like uh, in, the, in the general population, you see uh, most of the time a, a spontaneous remission, which you see also in, in what we previously used to call uh, uh, alcohol abuse. There we saw in the general population also very high spontaneous remission rates. So also in the course of the disorder, uh, there are similar indications. Then in the treatment, let's be fair, in the treatment we do the same things in terms of the psychotherapy. And one of the most fascinating studies that I know is on pathological gambling. Uh, they used uh, opiate uh, uh, receptor antagonists like nalmethine and uh, naltrexone. And it, it worked a little bit in pathological gambling and they were looking for uh, predictors of that effect. And the only predictor that it found was a history of uh, family history of alcohol dependence. And I think that shows very much that these disorders belong on one etiological, maybe also treatment uh, uh, dimension. So I think there's strong indications. And uh, if we start to talk about other disorders, I, I think there is some indication in buying. There's uh, definitely also in, uh, in uh, maybe, maybe at the end of the spectrum, maybe there is even something like uh, binge eating disorder, but you know more about that than I do. Well, let's broaden it a bit. So again, let's push, push a bit further. Should we then classify the disorders of addiction with impulse control disorders and even with obsessive compulsive and related disorders in one overarching compulsive spectrum disorder? Fernando, you, you've been talking yeah, about that. I was thinking that. also in our clinical experience. Actually, we see those spectrum disorders. We see anorexia, that they are basically much more compulsive and we think basically restricting anorexia. But if we concentrate in binge eating disorders, of course, the impulsive side is there. So we may need a better characterization, I believe, uh, of course, with some disorders where we have not sufficient evidences. With others, we have. Uh, you have mentioned gambling disorders is more clear, where the impulsivity is clearly there as a vulnerability factor in many of the uh, patients. Being cheating disorders, of course, also impulsivity is there, but uh, we may need to take into account other transdiagnostic uh, vulnerabilities, emotional dysregulation, which is probably not so specific because appears, of course, in substance use disorders, appears in eating disorders and appears also in gambling disorders. When we have a better characterization of them, probably we can, we can of course, uh, analyze more in depth what might be the personalized approach. With those that they are highly impulsive, of course, some approaches are needed. Otherwise, the approaches that we have so far, use of therapy, is limited. And again, so we may need to characterize better under my perspective different disorders where there are not evidences enough. Others are clear. Gambling, they are more in the impulsive side. Compulsive buying too. Many of the compulsive buying, sometimes if we think in eating disorders, around 16% of eating disorders, they may have compulsive buying and they have highly impulsive traits. Although they may use also for regulating emotions. Sophia. Yes, uh, I would like to ask in return a question. We, di we already had in the classifications these new disorders classified as impulse control disorders in the old classifications. But 
However, people were coming to addiction medicine facilities for treatment from the addiction perspective. Why? Because they made uh, spontaneously a link between substance use disorders and addictive behaviors. They wanted to have this kind of flag and this kind of help uh, from addiction specialists, okay? But not everything is addiction, as you said. I join you in telling this, because boundaries with normality uh, apply as well in the substance use disorders, and we should apply the same. There are convergences in clinical pictures between substance use disorders and addictive behaviors, but there are a lot of singularities as well. In clinical settings, for example, <coughs> you cannot treat people just applying the same psychotherapy as substance use disorders. You have a very specific way of understanding what's going on. What is gaming behavior? What is normal gaming behavior? What is gaming culture? What is going on uh, in the peers, for example? What is the emotional needs that are fulfilled positively? Gaming, for example. And setting the boundaries should be very, very careful. And I join you in telling not everything is addiction. But I would go, I would run for having those disorders within the addiction spectrum. So, so, I, I so Finn, go ahead. What about as, 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 as you were stating, yeah. Is OCD I, an I, addiction? First of all, for OCD, it would be so pitiful for you as an OCD person to be moved again in another section. But I think there is good reason so to be careful with, with OCD. Because let's be fair, if you think about both the etiology, but basically also the neurobiology, uh, I don't see that, th that there maybe is some overlap in some, but thinking just about the, 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 the activity of the anterior single, single cortex, which is overactivated in OCD patients. In most of our addicts, it's underactivated or not working at all. So I think there's really a, a, a big difference there. If you look at the treatments, you have success uh, in the OCD with uh, 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 SSRIs. Uh, maybe we don't, uh, we don't know for what. Maybe it's serotonin, maybe it's dopamine, and then it comes a little closer because in the OCD, higher doses of serotonin sometimes do something, which is not the case in, in the depression field. But we don't see any effect of uh, antidepressants in the field of addiction. So I think there's many reasons to be careful and to leave the OCD really in a different uh, uh, corner of the classification system. On the other hand, it's also true that I think the whole issue of, of the whole concept of uh, compulsive drug use is not as well established as the impulsive uh, drug use. I think there's beautiful animal models, but I think in the field of uh, human addiction, this compulsivity that sometimes more or less takes the, the behavior, the, 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 the concept not so much of, of compulsion or more of habitual behaviors, I think we're not there yet, so I, I wouldn't go in broadening into the uh, OCD direction. And impulsivity, I think there the discussion is, is more intense and there we, we really have to look better. And we have also to realize, I think some people still think that obs uh, compulsivity and impulsivity are opposite uh, factors and I think we know much better now. They can go together also. So I think there is an area to explore, but not in the OCD level. Yeah, well, that, that's very important. So, I mean, if impulsivity and compulsivity goes together, so that all means that these, these are obviously overlapping uh, categories. So, I mean, of course, I mean, classification is extremely important. I mean, it simplifies everything for us and it helps our everyday world, but it, these are not just not distinct categories. So it's uh, at the end, and yeah, as you mentioned in the introduction, so like, uh, Comp we call compulsive sexual behavior disorder and we classify it as an impulse control disorder. And I don't think that there's any problem with it. We also call the phenomenon sexual addiction or we call it hypersexuality before. And I don't think that's the major question if we consider whatever it is, we consider it as a sexual addiction and as an addiction disorder or a compulsive 
bt disorder and impulsivity it's all overlapping uh, features and we have strong traditions i mean eating disorders are classified as eating disorders and we won't probably think about ever to move them to another category just because they have impulsive or, or compulsive features as well. So one important, however, these classifications has a, an important message. And, and when we come back to uh, the non-substance related addictive disorders, then I think that that was a good decision because then the message is, is true. So that the message was clearly said that, that there are addictive behaviors which are not related to or, or to substances. So that, that was an important uh, uh, decision because, because it has a clear message. Further, what we include there or what we consider as a compulsive or impuls impulsivity related disorder, I think it's, it's, it's less important somehow. But it's good to know that when we, or, or that's an important change, that when we talk about addiction-like behaviors, that it's not always about substances or not exclusively about substances. It's, it's interesting in the field of the obsessive compulsive disorders, if we're thinking about treatment, that while what you're saying, Vin, that OCD is really rather different, responds quite well in general to SSRIs, whereas behavioral addictions, substance addictions don't tend to. But as you go down that list of other obsessive compulsive and related disorders, and you get to those body focused habit disorders, hair pulling disorder, trichotillomania, skin picking, they don't respond at all to SSRI, and there is evidence they respond to naltrexo, right. uh, uh, or um, they may, an acetylcysteine treatments that we think of that we're using in, in uh, behavioral addiction. So there may be some shifting around as to our diagnoses that we can learn as clinicians as well. I mean, I, I think the idea of comorbidity, I mean, is that helpful as a clinician in terms of treatment planning? Yeah, definitely, and I think it's um, yeah crucial issue not only as a diagnosis, but also when we are considering what type of approach we are going to have and what we are going to need. For instance, uh, of course, if we think you have mentioned that you and you too, so if we're thinking being cheating disorders, some of them they have compulsivity and impulsivity at the same time, of course, in some situations, although more broadly, probably impulsivity is going to be there. But what about those cases that they have compulsive buying at the same time, and even they have some gambling or also substance use disorders, they are highly impulsive, even more than the average eating disorders. Yeah. So, and you can detect also by fMRI studies that we are conducting and other groups too. I mean, so probably we may need to characterize this specific group to see also what type of approach might be better and maybe what type of uh, targets from regarding drugs might be better for them. So because otherwise we are there with a bunch of patients that they have heterogeneous char characteristics, compulsivity a bit, a lot of impulsivity, but we don't have clear mind about a specific neurobiomarker. So, so I like that very much. I think it very, comes very close to what uh, yeah, Joel yeah. is saying yeah. that uh, once is a one is a classification system, and basically some people don't want anything with it. I personally think that it has uh, certain uses, but at the same time, we should not put it in, 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 in concrete. Like if you meet patients, then you still have to think, where in the spectrum is my patient, for example? And so it makes you, might you make think of a certain psychotherapies or pharmacological interventions. So you have somebody who's a hoarder or who has uh, hair pulling. If you see a lot of uh, impulsivity and there is pleasure coming out of the hair pulling, then you have somebody, you might, you might think maybe naltrexone is an issue that could be considered. And you discuss it with your patient and you say, these are my, diagnostic, not classificatory, by diagnostic uh, uh, consideration. So I think that's what I like at, uh, in, in Joel's approach. Don't start to be very fixed on, on the classification. Classification system is okay, but in the, in the, uh, in the clinical uh, practice, you have to be more uh, creative and, uh, and flexible. So if as more or less common factors underpin uh, diagnosis and treatment, 
uh, across this range of disorders and we can learn from addictions in treating compuls impulsive, uh, compulsive people and we can learn in addiction from treating compulsive patients. Should we be providing more joined up services than we do at the moment? At the moment in many jurisdictions addiction is, is separate, substance addiction is separate, Be behavior addiction doesn't really have services for it quite yet but they're being developed and compulsive disorders tend to be uh, right in general psychiatry in the community mental health teams and impulse control disorders really don't have a home at all or in forensic psychiatry settings would it be meaningful to bring to take a more holistic approach in terms of clinical services and develop more integrated care systems mm -hmm. um, let's start with you Jolt I'm, I'm not working in a clinical setting and I think that uh, from a theoretical point of view and looking at all these overlaps, for sure it would be meaningful. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how feasible it would be in, in all cases, but that's maybe that yeah. I know it's Sophie yeah. or Fernando or, or mm. Dimit. So it, it, it makes sense, obviously, so, so but uh, mm -hmm. I think it, it treatment is more than just, uh, so it's, it's not mm -hmm. just the theory behind, but all those people uh, with different problems, with very different characteristics are there. But yep. yeah. So from yeah. the, from the, the approach of academia, yeah, yeah, it true. makes <laughs> theoretical <laughs> sense, but in the yeah. real world. Yeah. So uh, Fernando, uh, then Vin. Yeah, no, I think, you are right, so from the theoretical perspective, it makes sense, but if we think in practical um, area, so might be difficult. Might be difficult really to treat all together. Of course, we may need collaboration about the different services. So, because we need to think so about that those who have comorbid disorders, if we are thinking eating disorders and compulsifying and substance use disorders, they are going to be, uh, they are going to have the worst prognosis. They are going to drop out, and they are going to go from one service to the other. Some patients, they were coming to me with those features in the first interview. Is that true that you are going to send me to somewhere else? Yeah, she was right, because she was receiving this message from the different units. I think we may need to, if we think in the practical way, we may need to have collaboration. If we have a patient with an eating disorder, we have to, to collaborate with the services that they are dealing with substance use disorders and we have to have joint treatment. And also, if the patient has a gambling disorder or compulsive wine with Susana Jimenez, for instance, in our hospital, we have different units, but we are sending from one side to the other and they can be treated at the same time. The question maybe is, so can we put all together? In some cases, I think it might be difficult. If we think for eating disorders, might be difficult to put binge eating disorders, maybe with substance use disorders, especially binge eating disorders, they do have not substance use disorders. But that means not that we can use some common approaches. That means so if we think, for instance, can we develop as we did a video game to treat impulsivity and emotional regulation? And of course, we may apply with different type of diagnosis and with different type of patients. It's a trans-diagnostic approach. Yeah. What, what do you think? I, I mean, we'd have to win hearts and minds, wouldn't we? Yeah, the mind is not difficult because I think when I did uh, psychiatric training, I think we still were trained in separate disorders and we didn't talk about comorbidity. Now we know that having one disorder is the exception. Uh, having comorbid disorders from all the clusters is the rule. So from that perspective, it's very clear that uh, psychologists and psychiatrists have to be trained in the whole range of disorders, which doesn't mean so much in terms of uh, psychotherapies. It's, it's very much the same principles that we do. In terms of the pharmacotherapy, I think uh, well, that's not a, a big thing. But we have to realize that it's sometimes very difficult. It did take a long time before there came some, at least in Europe, places where alcohol dependence was finally combined with the, with the Department of Drug Dependence. They were separated many places. There were places where 
women and men with addictions or with any kind of disorder. Now, most hospitals have, somatic hospitals have just uh, rooms where male and females, they, they live there together. And, but it took a long time. So I guess that uh, uh, you're right, that it's going to be difficult because it's a lot of defending your own little territory. But it's obvious that this is the way f forward. So uh, let's push you even further. The idea of working toward holistic services sounds positive, but many of these disorders start in childhood, or the seeds are in childhood. And there in psychiatry, there's often this big divide from as the, as the child progresses from child, child and adolescent mental health to adult services. If we're thinking about you know, cross-diagnostic uh, collaboration. Should we be thinking about ab abolishing that threshold, uh, certainly within this, this range of disorders? Sophia, you're an expert in this yes. area. For me, there is, uh, I, would say, I would say first that there is no wrong door to come in for treatment, no wrong door. Then the clinician should have sufficient uh, uh, choices to offer to the people may uh, un under different uh, scopes and different uh, uh, psychotherapic tools and cross ages as well it should be should from my perspective very helpful in addictive behaviors treatment for example my experience uh, leading a specialized facility in addictive behaviors within an addiction division within a department of psychiatry is that a, a, at a very uh, in a daily basis, we do need to collaborate with other services from general psychiatry to, to make uh, a joint treatment, for example, for dual diagnosis between the addictive behaviors and the other uh, mental health disorders, OCD, uh, other kind of disorders, depressive anxiety disorders at the same time, to treat them at the same time. And at the same time, we collaborate as well with the pedopsychiatry, ch children and adolescent psychiatry as well, because we do see patients now, we are asked for, we have treatment demands for 11 years old, nine years old, uh, in an addiction specialized treatment facility for addictive behaviors. Obviously, n there is no, uh, uh, a tag, a flag for addiction when you have nine years old. It's something uh, that has to do with all development or limit setting from parents or uh, something going wrong in the environment. So you should explore that and you should uh, connect with the, the specialized uh, professionals uh, dealing with uh, uh, child and adolescent psychiatry. So collaborating, integrating, yes, but it should speak also to, also to the people coming to treatment centers, uh, do they uh, come to impulse control disorders uh, treatment facility? Maybe not, because they, they are not uh, able to, to know what is impulse control disorder, for example, but addictive treatment center or psych general psychiatry should be maybe more understandable from the uh, user's perspective. And having uh, facilities cross age, yes, collaboration cross age, yes, and as well across genders, which is very important to as well consider the gender, the female in the treatment demand, and there are very specific treatment demands, and to address them uh, whether in addiction uh, centers or in general psychiatric centers. Fernando. What's your thoughts on this? Uh, you have addressed a very important issue, which is the, the transition from also from child adolescence to adulthood. And at least in the disorders we are discussing here, I think it's very important too. And this is a gap that we have also in all over Europe. The European Psychiatric Association has developed a value of treatment approach and network uh, group that we are working on that trying to develop some services that they can have this transition really completed. So otherwise, I don't know, in your countries, in our countries, when the patient has 17, 18, drop the treatment, although have been referred to adulthood unit. So we may need to make an efficient transition. Some groups, some countries, they are trying to include uh, adulthood therapies in the childhood phase. 
So in order to make this transition effective, we may need to think again so from this developmental approach that also is going to be across over diagnosis. And then of course we may need to pay attention probably to make not only regarding clinical work, but also regarding research, we may need to develop more this developmental perspective, trying to detect really the factors that are going to probably to develop to different disorders that they might be linked. I tend to agree with most of, of, of what you're saying, and especially that psychiatry uh, has a lot to learn from uh, child and adolescent psychiatry in taking uh, uh, developmental history uh, series again and uh, uh, being also nice to people because some said it's very difficult in psychiatric units. On the other hand, I can imagine I, in, in my own hospital there is actually a very close collaboration between the uh, uh, child and adolescent psychiatry and just pediatrics, which gives a wonderful opportunity of not uh, early dis uh, stigmatization. They come just to a, uh, to a, a child care unit which is also a charming thing. It, it means that you have to move sometime maybe to the adult psychiatry, but uh, I think that is if you start to weigh the pro and cons. Also, the local situation with the, uh, the pediatric department, but it could also be a very, very nice collaboration, keep them with the, with the other children with, uh, with uh, health problems. So I, I would say it depends a little bit on local situation with the best option. But there's definitely a risk that, that you lose people on the way if they go from the transition from child and adolescent to adult psychiatry. Yeah. With the, uh, that's exactly what I wanted to say with an additional point that we have to be especially careful, as you mentioned, for example, in the case of gaming disorder, which is often, which often shows uh, uh, just a spontaneous recovery. So then it is especially important not to not to stigmatize or not to, to involve somebody into a kind of treatment which which leads to stigmatization while maybe in one year or and maybe it's not even the addiction focus what has to be treated in in those cases so it's 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 quite often so what we see is 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 obviously uh, on the phenomenological level is an addiction like something but in the background there are just maybe normative problems with development family problems so it's uh, but probably different countries different treatment cultures has has different responses on these issues or not but they should have so that to me it's very similar what we sometimes do with uh, uh, elderly people with a so-called benzodiazepine addiction don't do it. Don't call these elderly women, most of the women, yeah. don't call them addicted. They have yeah. uh, something what we call maybe uh, uh, withdrawal syndrome. They're, they're probably not addicted and they're not going to be happy from the diagnosis of addiction, these elderly women. So I think we should take this stigmatization definitely in the, if we talk about the, yeah. the children, we should take it very serious and be careful there, yeah. like we do with the elderly. We should do. So we're, we're coming towards the end, and we've been talking in, in terms of uh, neuroscience, we've talked about clinical issues. We haven't really been talking about social and health policies around addiction. And I think before we finish, we've had one discussion point tabled. Um, the statement is we, we really need global health and social care policy change to adequately meet the needs of people suffering from addiction, compulsions, and habits. Um, and of course, I'm minded of the regulation, regulatory issues within behavior addictions, which are still at a very preliminary stage. Zolt, I know you've been involved in some of that work. What, what's your overall view about that? And where are we at? Well, yeah, um, I mean, that's a very important issue. And yeah, so we, we, we need we, we need or we need policies. So I mean, we have most countries and also in international level, we have alcohol policies and there are regulations related to gambling and there are policies or not depending on the, on the country. But uh, when it comes to gaming or video game use, 
then then we are very much at the beginning of the of, of, of anything so just and and we should think about which is very complicated so what on one hand but on the other hand that's exactly uh, an area where where minors are involved so so the main population here is just under 18 or 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 even children and 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 then of course young adults as well but, uh, but on the other hand it's it's very difficult and, and yeah so i think there are many many questions which should be uh, looked at uh, here but we would need some so it's 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 an unregulated uh, field with the video games and uh, it's not independent so it's not separated from gambling for example and and wise gambling is regulated in most countries let's say but we see the convergence between gaming and and gambling very clearly so we find a lot of gambling related features in the video games offered to minors again that includes monetization that includes loot boxes uh, and and many uh, other aspects and that's kind of putting gambling into gaming often unregulated and and that's that 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 especially um, bores us to to look at it very carefully there are some initiatives in some countries like china regulated video game use for minors quite strictly and we don't know I how it will work or not work so it's 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 an kind of an exciting uh, natural experiment and i hope it will be monitored uh, as well um, i don't know what the solution is but but we should look at it if, if you were going to make a suggestion to governments i mean the uk government is looking at the digital safety act at the moment uh, what would you what would you, what would you bet on what would be the best regulatory advice you could give would it be age limits or i i don't know i mean you cannot limit i mean you cannot a lot of things you cannot limit and and it's it's quite complicated also because uh, i think one of the most exciting and most problematic question that what do you want to regulate and what do you want the families should regulate or you want to leave it for just the 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 yeah for the families so we, we wrote a piece a commentary on the chinese regulation for example it technically took out everything out of the hands of the parents is it good or not so i mean maybe some parents are happy that yeah it's all solved um I, I do not have to say how many hours because yeah, the government already decided that it's one and a half hour and that's it Ma maybe it's even more complex because for most of the drugs we don't know i think there is almost no drug that you can say it's really beneficial it's fun maybe and it's uh but it's not beneficial, most of the drugs. Uh, alcohol, I know that uh, Jürgen Rehm once told me if it would be serious looked upon, the, l the, the safe level of drinking would be one glass per year. Um, <laughs> I, I guess there's a few people who drink more than that here, <laughs> but that is different with gaming. There is, I think, good evidence now that gaming is maybe beneficial for kids. They, they get the cognitive enhancement and so uh, to make regulations is actually not so simple because why should we take away something that is beneficial for the development of your cognitive abilities? <laughs> yeah, uh, I agree. it's two sides obviously. So the one is a regulation towards the society, the users, and that's quite complicated. And it's also complicated, but still the, the regulation of the industry. So that's something that, that should really happen, which is, as I say, it's happened most cases in most countries regarding gambling, but it has not happened uh, in the case of uh, the video game. And, and that's, that's something where it could be started. So obviously, if there are some features or some uh, uh, things that are provided to the users, so obviously the, the, this is something where it could be started. And it we have to be not too optimistic to work with the, uh, the producers. We have experience with the alcohol industry and with the tobacco industry. I think I'm, I'm, I'm not very optimistic that it will be better with the gambling and gaming industry. So I think uh, society has to take the, uh, the lead here and not... Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. 
I, I would Please. add on this, yes, it's very difficult and very hard to regulate and to set policy making. I come from a culture, from a country of the four pillars. And the four pillars to be considered are prevention, treatment, harm reduction, and regulation. So the four are playing a very crucial role and from my perspective should be applied to addictive behaviors. How to regulate addictive behaviors? Taking the example, for example, of gaming. In my country, Switzerland, we have uh, started to uh, uh, try to regulate uh, the gaming use for children to protect them from eventual harms caused by these, uh, these, uh, this offer, this leisure offer. But not that easy because quantity is not the uh, key uh, point to, to, to have to take into account when you are a policy maker trying to make the threshold between what should be and what not should be in terms of age categories as well. So very difficult, work in progress, being careful, but from my perspective, considering the four pillars as well. Thank you, Sophia. Well, on that point, that cautious point, optimistic point, it's time for us, the hour has gone very quickly, it's time for us to review our statements. I've written down the scores that we uh, achieved at the beginning. I wonder if anybody's minds have been changed. So Silke, can you put the first question? Oh, for those of you who didn't turn on your phones, please open the QR code so you can vote again. And then Silke, can you put up the... Um, first question again, or the first statement. Current diagnostics is 100%. Oh, <laughs> oh, no, no, oh, no. oh, no, oh, no, we've <laughs> lost it. <laughs> 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 Too impulsive. So, I'm waiting for the last votes to come through. I'll give you another five seconds. So it was 60% at the beginning, it's 55%. So we've introduced a scintilla of doubt. You may say that's not a significant difference, but uh, possibly some shift with a, a, a greater number of disagreements this time. So uncertainty in this area. Excellent. Silke, can we have the second question, please? Joined up clinical services should be provided. So let's see how we go here. So it seems to be, whilst the scores are coming in, it seems to be quite clear that while we're really relatively unsure about diagnosis, this is something we talked about, maybe it's as good as we're going to get and there's going to be shifting around and a lot of uncertainty. In terms of treatment, 70% of you still think that there should be progress towards a more joined up holistic approach to these disorders. And I think the panel would would broadly agree with that. So at this point, I'd like to thank you, the audience. It's a been a very long day. Thank you very much. And of course, I'd like to thank our marvelous panel. Thank you. Thank you. And please do enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>